As we start to think about architecting more sustainable systems, making our systems as efficient and economic as possible is a really important component. And a really good way to think about that is using the Reactive Manifesto. Now, if you're not familiar with the Reactive Manifesto, this was published right back in 2014, nearly 10 years ago now. And two of the key components of the Reactive Manifesto are that a reactive system should be both elastic and message driven. This suits perfectly to our efficient, um, sustainable systems that are going to scale up when there is work and scale down when there isn't work and focus on asynchronous communication to help us better deal with unexpected load. So in this video, we're gonna focus on the message component of a message driven system. Of course, it's really easy to get started passing messages around your system. But what are the different types of messages that you might want to pass around? And what things are important to think about as you scale that across your entire organization? And for the purpose of this video, we're gonna have a look at some code written in .NET. These same ideas apply with whatever type of programming language you're using. And we're gonna focus on three primary types of messages today. And that are, they are command messages, document or data messages, and also events. And there's gonna be a whole nother video down the line focusing on events in particular. For today, we'll focus on this high level concepts. And to start with commands, a command is simply um, a request to another system to do some work. You're asking somebody else to do something. Place order, dispatch order, take payment. These are all examples of commands. They express an intent of a system. And if we're thinking asynchronously, typically that message will be passed onto some kind of message channel. So here we've got the def basic definition of a command. And that basic definition says that we always need to include an endpoint for this command. So when we actually come to send the command, we know where to send it to. That This could be HTTP. But remember, we're thinking asynchronously. So this is going to be some kind of asynchronous message channel. If we look at an actual implementation of a command, you see here we are implementing a create order command, something to actually go and create an order. And we want to create an order. At this point, all we've got is a customer name. We want to create an order for a given customer. This message both has a message type of create order and also the message channel that was overridden from that base type. That, in this case, is being pulled from an environment variable. Behind the scenes, this is gonna use something like SNS to actually send that command onto a topic. Now, typically, commands don't really expect a response. We're saying, can you please do this thing? And not really expecting anything to come back. If we did want something to come back, however, we could add an additional property to our command. We could say, instead of just sending up in a message channel endpoint, we also want to specify a response, a response channel endpoint as well. And this could um, be optional, so we can make that a nullable string like that and that way we can now specify that as well as having a message channel that we're going to send the command on we also want to receive a response back on a channel as well and if there's one really important thing to take away from this video when you start introducing messaging into your system is that to be really intentional about the schema of your messages and there's some really simple strategies to do that one of which is what we call the metadata data pattern so if we have a look at our actual message publisher, the, the thing that's actually publishing messages on our behalf, the parameter that comes into the method is just our message itself. But what happens actually under the hood is that that gets wrapped in this message wrapper object. And it's this message wrapper that will be then published to our message channel or event bus or whatever the endpoint might be. And if we actually have a look at this message wrapper, it adds some additional data. So what this takes in when it's created is just the data, the payload itself, and optionally a response channel of some kind. And then we have this metadata and this data property. If we have a look at the metadata property, this holds some really interesting information that's agnostic really to the type of event. We have the trace identifier, a uniquely generated message ID, in this case, just using a new GUID, the type of message, optionally, 
the response channel to send a response back on. Remember, if we're using queries or commands, we might need a response back. And then the date the message was actually sent. So when we create this message wrapper object, we create this new metadata section that'll include some really useful information. So our consumer can then consume that message and carry on the trace. It can link all these distributed traces together. It can easily implement item potency because we've got the unique message identifier and it can send a response back if it needs to, it knows where to send the response. So just be really intentional about the schema that you use, the format of your message and try and get that consistent across your entire organization with the unique data in some kind of data property or payload property. Okay, so to demonstrate some of these different message types, what I've put together is a really simple Lambda function that's going to read messages from an SQS queue. It's gonna loop over the messages. It's going to run our query against the customer service. It's gonna send our create order command and then it's gonna publish an order created event. And these things are gonna happen. Actually, if we look at our message publisher code, all that is really doing is just logging the message to CloudWatch and that's just so we can have a look at what's actually going on under the hood. So if I flick over to Postman now, I've got an API that I can send requests to to make these requests. And this is actually using the storage first API pattern, one of my favorite patterns for building reactive and asynchronous systems. And we'll cover that in a future video. So if I just hit this API with a few requests now, you see what we're getting back is actually the payload from the message being stored on SQS. It's really cool. If we go over to the AWS console now, and we have a look at our message processor stack in the console, and we look at this later, latest log stream, you see we've got this brand new set of messages here. We're running a query on the channel and expecting a response. And then we've actually got the payload of our query. We've got the payload of our command, and then we've got the payload of our event as well. And I've actually pulled these out of CloudWatch and dropped them into my IDE just so that we can have a look at these in a bit more of a nicely formatted way. So you see all of these different types of messages have got the same consistent section and all of the trace parents are actually the same across all three because these were all generated by the same producer. We've got unique message IDs in every case, the message type is different, the date sent should be almost identical just because there's no other work going on. And then of course we've got the optional, optional response channel which is only set for our query, we're expecting a response back from the consumer of our query message. This is really cool and then obviously the payload itself changes completely. When we're querying, we're querying for a specific customer. When we're creating an order, again we've only got the same payload here in the real world that would likely include data about the order, maybe the items on the order, the price, the delivery address, etc. But here we've only got the name. And then our event that actually gets published, our order created event includes then some more information, the order number and the unique order identifier. What I hope you, what I want you to take away from this video is as you start to adopt messaging, message driven systems, event driven systems, is to be really intentional about the type of message that you're using. Use the right type of message for the right job and also be really intentional about the schemas that you use. So here we've covered the three different types of messages. In the next video, we're gonna dive deeper into events because within events, there's a whole range of different things we need to think about. Fat events, sparse events, notification events, how to manage the schemas of the events and make sure that we're not causing breaking changes to our consumers. But for that, I will see you next time.